Continuing on the theme that I uh, explained this morning, that pe uh, peace is a very complex topic and multifaceted. Um, you heard an architect describe what he's doing in relation to making communities a better place for especially those who are not often thought of in a, in a city environment. Um, now we're going to switch to another very important topic that um, informs this whole process of what does peace mean, which is to focus on women and their place in the world. And it is really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne Marie Goetz. She is a professor at New York University Center for Global Affairs. And before this, she's been there, uh, she started there in 2014. Before this, she served at the UN, United Nations Women for, from 2005 to 2014 as Chief Advisor on Women, Peace, and Security. She is a political scientist who specializes in research and development policies in fragile states to promote the interest of marginalized social groups, particularly poor women. She also researches conditions for democratization and good governance in South Asia and East Africa. She has worked at the United Nations since 2005 as Chief Advisor on Governance, Peace, Security for UNIFEM. Prior to joining UNIFEM in 2005, Professor Goetz uh, is now an author of eight books on subjects of gender, politics, and policy in developing countries and on accountability reforms. Please welcome to the stage Professor Anne-Marie Goetz. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank um, Professor Mahmoudi for inviting me and uh, congratulate you on the very interesting work you're doing with the chair in peace. Um, it's very impressive uh, from the viewpoint of the UN what the Baha'i community does actually in terms of enabling networks and conversations that don't um, otherwise happen or don't happen easily. And one of those networks and conversations are the networks that happen between women and marginalized groups. And I'd like to thank actually Bani uh, Dugal, who's the Baha'i representative um, in New York for her extraordinary work and frankly, the, um, the good things that you've done for women, UN women and UNIFEM in enabling certain conversations to happen. Um, so thank you for, it, for that. I'm going to be talking about what we've learned from women's engagement in conflict resolution um, in uh, resolving uh, very serious um, international conflicts. Before I do that, though, I thought it might be worth um, quickly uh, just doing a summary of what are the issues around women, war, and peace. Um, we read about so many gendered aspects of conflict right now. Uh, you must have read about the bureaucratization of rape by ISIS in relation to Yazidi communities. Um, the upsurge in sexual violence in South Sudan with the conflict there. Um, we're very aware that the refugee flow uh, from Syria and other Mediterranean fringe countries is suddenly 70% male, which is very, very unusual, actually. It's usually the other way around. Um, so we hear about conflict all the time, and men and women experience conflict in different ways. Um, and because they experience conflict in different ways, they have different needs and they make different contributions to conflict. Um, that's the core of the women, peace and security agenda, this observation. More men are victims of homicide in conflict. More men die than women in conflict. Um, women and children survive, but often with extraordinary wounds, including sexual, the wounds of sexual violence, 
which is a war wound which is not celebrated in war memorials and only recently has been prosecuted in war crimes tribunals. Um, so they, they experience conflict differently, which generates different needs. And the question is, are those needs addressed by the international community? We are most familiar with thinking of women as victims, and those are the images that we see in international news coverage. I mentioned sexual violence. There's many other forms of victimization, deprivation of property rights, sep separation from family and children. Um, Pregnant women suffer differently from men when it comes to issues of mass starvation and other forms of deprivation. Um, and of course, after conflict, often women uh, experience recovery very differently. Most conflicts see a surge in female-headed households. In um, conflicts in Africa, up to 40, sometimes 60% of households are female-headed. In Mozambique, for example, after the war, 60% of households were female-headed. And yet, when you think about the priorities in economic recovery post-conflict, often the job priorities go to men, often uh, loans are most accessible to men. Um, so female-headed households, um, which are greater in number than before, suffer huge problems in terms of recovery, because not only are there more female-headed households, but they also have an expanded dependency burden, where you have um, a woman taking care not only of her own children, but those that she's inherited from others as well as elderly people. So there's, they're more in number, they have a bigger dependency burden, and yet they actually are not a recovery priority in most co post-conflict situations. But women and men, of course, are actors in conflict as well. Um, and uh, in many ways, uh, we are very, very unfamiliar with thinking of women as soldiers, as part of fighting forces. We may be familiar with them as forced combatants or forced uh, members of fighting forces, for example, as sex slaves or being uh, conscripted forcibly into cooking and cleaning and so on for fighting forces. But in fact, in modern um, armed insurgencies and in modern armies, women actually compose a significant number of fighting forces. At one point in the Nepal conflict, they were 30 to 40% of the fighters. There are a considerable proportion of the FARC fighters in Colombia, about 30%. Um, even in Muslim uh, insurgencies, such as the Muslim Mindanao, the um, Muslim, uh, sorry, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in Mindanao in the Philippines, there is a female fighting auxiliary. So women actually are very active as combatants, as spies, um, as engaged uh, in the political project of the insurgency or of the conflict. And then, of course, women and men can be agents of peace and of uh, resolution. Um, and it's really uh, in the first and last of these three categories that we're most familiar with looking at women. Women as victims and women as agents of peace. You're familiar with the women in black in Serbia, for example, or in Israel. Um, there's the famous uh, situation in Liberia of the Christian Muslim alliance surrounding the uh, mostly male peace talks in Ghana and blockading the men from coming out in order to accelerate decision making, a very successful example, in fact. Um, unlike our previous speaker, uh, I do not have video material in my presentation, um, but um, and I loved his presentation. I wish I could emulate that kind of degree of dexterity uh, with, with uh, presentation materials. But should you be interested in the Liberia story, there is a fabulous film called Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which uh, documents the experience of the Liberian women's group in, um, uh, in, in accelerating the peace process and in pushing the male negotiators to stop dithering and to get to an agreement. And I will be talking about what we've learned from these types of experiences. Um, just in terms of elaborating a bit on the um, the gendered analysis of conflict before I get into the analysis of positive experiences. Um, I mentioned sexual violence at the outset. It is certainly not the only war crime that women experience, and women are not the only victims of sexual violence by any means. Men are too, nor are men the only perpetrators. The most recent conviction of the International Criminal Court in Rwanda 
was of a woman, and one of the crimes for which she was convicted was rape. Uh, Pauline Niramishuko was convicted for organizing mass rape of Tutsi women in her constituency with the collaboration of the militias managed by her son. To the eternal shame of the global women's movement, Pauline Niramishuko had been the uh, minister on women's affairs. Um, so it's not as if women are immune from this, but the um, engagement of women in um, organizing sexual violence is a helpful example of how sexual violence is not necessarily about an aggressive manifestation of heterosexuality. Um, it is about um, a sexual manifestation of aggression. It is a weapon of war. It's a method of fighting. Um, it's a method of fighting that makes it more dangerous as General Patrick Kammert, who was a force commander in Eastern DRC. It's a, a weapon of war, a tactic of fighting that makes it more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier. Um, uh, in fact, it's more dangerous to be a civilian of any kind than a soldier in many uh, contemporary conflicts, which target civilians explicitly for attack. Um, sexual violence has been around forever, uh, but it hasn't been talked about a lot and hasn't been directly addressed in policy responses until really historically quite recently. Um, uh, I mean, as long ago as Grotius, when, when writing about the laws of war, uh, he did mention that sexual violence was an inadm inadmissible way of fighting. That's in the 1400s. Um, and of course, in the Geneva Conventions and in the... Um, the protocols to those conventions in 79, sexual violence was recognized as a violation of the laws of war. But it wasn't until the mid 90s um, that we first saw a, a, a conviction for sexual violence in conflict. And that of course was the famous um, International Criminal of Tribunal of Rwanda conviction of Jean-Paul Akiyesu uh, for organized sexual violence. Of course, since the Rome Statute of 2000, the International Criminal Court has treated this very seriously. There's been a number of indictments um, for, for sexual violence. So it's, it's seen as a very, very serious international crime. While at the UN, um, as the, uh, uh, while I was working on peace and security at the UN, working with the Security Council, four resolutions on sexual violence were passed. And the Security Council now routinely considers sexual violence when looking at um, its responsibility to ensure the protection of civilians in certain conflicts. So we've moved a long way on sexual violence. It's moved from being what was called history's greatest silence, which by the way, is another excellent film on gender and war, The Greatest Silence by Lisa Jackson about the Congo. It's moved from being um, history's greatest silence to now being a, a war crime that is recognized for which uh, soldiers, peacekeepers are trained to um, how to detect it, how to set up preventative systems, how to build uh, protective environments for, for women in, in uh, conflict. Um, it's just extremely effective as a method of fighting. It's cheaper than guns. It is um, often treated as a form of reward for soldiers uh, in lieu of payments. And that's what we just heard recently from South Sudan, that both sides, um, encourage sexual violence uh, because of um, challenges in getting soldiers paid. So it was seen as a form of payment to soldiers. Um, that indicates command responsibility, which is prosecutable. Um, so commanding sexual violence or condoning it constitutes command responsibility. And we all know that if commanders can prevent and punish desertion, they can prevent and punish sexual violence. Um, as General Mark said at the beginning of uh, the Africa campaign in World War II, the American general, um, he notified his soldiers the night before that the invasion and the um, attacks were going to start the next day. And he said, so guys, tomorrow the fighting is going to start. And I know that um, when the fighting starts, I'm going to start hearing about the rapes. Just want you to know that when I hear about the rapes, you're going to hear about the hangings. So in other words, command responsibility is real and it, sexual violence is a preventable um, uh, aspect of fighting. So this has been what's so revolutionary about the UN's approach certainly is um, treating this extremely seriously um, in conflict. 
uh, indeed, the reason it is uh, addressed by the Security Council at all is it's now recognized firmly as a threat to international peace and security. Um, now, we're used to thinking about gender in conflict, as I said, um, in terms of stereotyped roles, women as victims, men as fighters, women as mourning mothers. Um, these are women in Sri Lanka mourning um, people who've disappeared. And we're familiar with that uh, paradigm of women as bereft and mourning mothers um, from uh, Argentina and the uh, dictatorship there. Um, we see this uh, everywhere. Um, this actually is a very valuable form of protest that women engage in as a contribution to conflict resolution, frankly, because often when other forms of political expression are denied in authoritarian or repressive regimes, um, few of these regimes are able to deny women the right to protest on the basis of their gendered role, um, which is often sanctioned and promoted by the regime. Um, but we have to bear in mind that we shouldn't be blinded by our stereotypes. You may be familiar with this famous photograph from just a month ago, uh, which is a Syrian father pulling his children out of the water into uh, the safe landing spot of Kos, the island of Kos in Greece. Um, we're seeing many images of, of parenting, of fathering, um, coming out of the Syrian war. Uh, and in many ways, this image and the awful picture of the three-year-old Aslan uh, drowned in the um, beach. I think that was also Kos? No, that was on a Turkish beach. Um, those awful images of fathers and children in terrible straits have actually, very interestingly, weirdly, changed our understanding and our sympathies, actually, about the refugee crisis. And, um, opened a new awareness of what this means. Seeing this burly, powerful looking man in tears as he um, saves and clutches to his children um, has, has uh, generated a complete change in thinking in Europe towards, um, well, let's not say complete change in thinking, but a greater openness in Europe towards refugees. Um, this is a dad just like me, just like you. You know, this is a, a parent who who everybody can relate to. Um, and as I said at the beginning, it's very interesting. The refugee flow has changed in character. The current flow is 69% male, 13% women, adult women, and 18% children. Um, very, very unusual. Usually, the proportion of refugees is quite different. It's 60 to 70% um, female adults and, um, and children. Um, this indicates, uh, as, as you know, of course, um, uh, recruitment age men fleeing from Syria, uh, fleeing from the, the danger of being recruited by any side, forcibly or otherwise. And it raises a question, where are the women? Are they left behind in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon in the camps, um, where they're not allowed to work, and they're lucky? if they're part of the, I think it's roughly 12, 14% get the daily cash stipend from um, the international community. Otherwise, how are they gonna get money? You know, as well as I do, how they're gonna get money. Sex work. If you're not allowed to work, you're driven into a, an underground economy. And your children are too. Um, so leaves questions open as to where are the women? And where are the women who are left behind in Syria? How are they surviving? Um, interestingly, in conflict, um, this, this fact of um, sexed or, or gendered flight patterns, departure patterns, um, sometimes creates extraordinary opportunities to challenge gender roles. And women are given the opportunity or forced, you know, it depends on how you analyze it, to move into non-traditional gendered roles. In South Africa, the banning of oppositional politics during the apartheid regime, the jailing of major uh, ANC leaders, and their um, expulsion, self-expulsion from the country, actually greatly empowered the women's movement to take on massively significant leadership roles, which then resulted in their power move during the South African constitutional discussions where women were able to demand a 50% quota representation in the negotiations on the Constitution and to entrench 
women's rights in the Constitution and gender equality and even sexual equality rights to an extent that had never been seen before in the 1996 Constitution. Um, so often when men are unable to take up leadership roles, women do. And they sustain these leadership roles often at a community level um, into the post-conflict period and are able to leverage this as a means of challenging unequal gender roles. And this is happening right now in the Philippines, in Mindanao, in Nepal, um, and in a number of other post-conflict situations. Um, let's also not forget, as I mentioned, that women are combatants and that they throw their lot in with insurgent groups, um, with political uh, projects and military projects even. Of course, what's so bewildering and confusing right now is that groups that um, turn to violence um, and are inspired by extremist interpretations of religious texts seem to be simultaneously recruiting women and torturing them. And it's maybe not the same ones. Um, and this is actually a really bewildering and baffling development. So we see ISIS making a concerted effort to recruit women fighters and uh, participants in their struggle, but for a very gender constrained uh, role. Um, here, this is a picture of an Al-Shabaab fighter in Somalia, um, which again is, is, is contradictory and confusing. Someone who is accepting a constrained gender role and yet taking up in terms of veiling, et cetera, and yet taking up arms and you know, violating the, 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 the precepts of a constrained gender role. So very interesting developments right now in terms of women's engagement in violent religious extremist groups. All right, so what I was gonna talk about today was um, women's involvement in conflict resolution and uh, what we've learned from successful efforts um, where women seek to get involved in conflict resolutions. So any guesses um, which, uh, which conflict this one is about? This is a peace table, one of many actually preparatory peace tables for a still unresolved conflict? Very good, yes, Syria, thank you. Um, so this is actually a pre-talk with uh, William Haig and John Kerry visible at the table, as well as a number of members of various um, leaders of, um, uh, a number of leaders of various Syrian uh, factions, and also um, many ambassadors uh, from the many countries, the Friends of Syria, that supported the, um, the Geneva talks, Geneva I and Geneva II, both failed. I don't really need to point out that there is a certain, uh, how shall we call it? Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's quite clear, and um, it's hardly unusual. Um, Whereas in the parliaments of the world, the world has moved on with so many parliaments having at least a minimum 25% of decision makers being women. Of course, the United States is a big exception, um, not faring as well as many other countries in that regard. Uh, we, we've, we've seen women active in political decision making around the world at, from local to national level. Peace talks, peace processes remain stubbornly stubbornly male-dominated to an ex extraordinary degree. And this is in spite of international commitments uh, agreed in the Security Council and many other regional, many regional intergovernmental organizations that women should participate in peacemaking, that they have an important role to make in conflict resolution. Is it already le nearly 11? Do I only have five minutes left? Am I okay? Oh, okay. You, thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, the international community is committed to women's engagement in peace processes. Um, and the people at this table, William Hague, John Kerry, all these ambassadors are committed to women's engagement in peace processes. And yet, um, not only do they not apparently succeed, if they even try, to get the parties to conflict to bring women to the table, um, but they themselves don't. Um, and this reflects the male dominance of foreign policy establishments and of international diplomacy, in fact. For which reason, I've actually become a member of an advocacy campaign to elect a woman to be the next Secretary General, because after 70 years of men leading the world, it might be just at least interesting to try it out with a woman. Um, in case anyone's tweeting, 
Um, in case anyone's tweeting the campaign, uh, you could use hashtag she for SG. She for SG or at she for SG. Um, okay, so uh, women are very involved in conflict resolution and here's an example of a woman's peace table. This example comes from Mindanao uh, in the Philippines. And um, uh, at the center in, the, in a pink jacket is Irene Santiago, who is a peace leader from the Philippines, um, also used to work in the UN. And this is actually very interesting because what this table is about in this case is linking indigenous women's conflict resolution efforts in Mindanao, which have been going on under the radar for decades, to a national effort to elevate the status of gender questions and gender issues in the peace process in the Philippines. The indigenous effort in, um, in, the, in, the, in Mindanao has been led by women religious leaders called the Alemat, religious scholars. And um, what they've been doing is seeking reconciliation between rival clans that pursue deadly uh, vendettas against each other. It's a, a mafia type situation, it's called the Rudo. The, the Rudo is a, a revenge-oriented cult of violence between clans. Um, and this group of women have been able to negotiate um, the, uh, the end of these clan conflicts, which by the way, triggered the Mindanao conflict in the first place before it then escalated into a conflict against the Philippine government itself. Um, so, um, Across the Philippines, women's organizations, which as you know are very strong, work together to elevate and amplify women's voice in the peace process, which had gone on for 17 years. And women's engagement and, and accelerated um, uh, sort of support to the process began in about 2002. And the result has been absolutely extraordinary, uh, culminating in the peace agreement of March 17th last year where women really pushed on both sides to hurry up, get over differences, come to an agreement, and subject uh, some of the very thorny issues about power sharing and wealth sharing to a national constitutional process, a national um, debate. I'll get to the details in a second. So we've got the formal track one peace process, male dominated, and many, many informal, subterranean, under the radar processes, very female dominated, working on real human connection and uh, enabling communities to get over it and live together. And why aren't these two connecting? Peace processes are absolutely crucial roadmaps to recovery and to building new societies. Um, and um, you know, it could be argued, and I've often heard male mediators argue, that let's, we'll, we'll deal with the gender question later. We'll get to that. Um, because right now, it's the most urgent thing is to stop the killing. And nobody would disagree that the most urgent thing is to stop the killing. But there is a very crucial moment of system change, which is fleeting, which is accessible to change-minded individuals at the peace table when the peace agreement is drafted. Because that's a crucial moment to plant the seed of a commitment to change. And it's, it's very important to seize this moment. And so many of these moments have been missed. So this is a major priority for the international women's movement. Um, one of the problems, of course, is even telling the story of the conflict and who it affected and how. Um, and that story, if, if, if women and other excluded groups aren't there at the beginning to tell the story, it's not good enough to say, you can tell your story later, you can seek your justice later. It just doesn't seem to work that way. And there's a, um, a curious uh, quality of public recognition and I think we need to call it a, um, anointment almost, um, which comes with being seen to be involved in resolving a conflict, which is denied to women and to women leaders. Um, even when a mediator comes in and the international community comes in or the regional community comes in and um, appoints or identifies or recognizes significant actors to take part in a peace process, the failure to see women 
is actually profoundly dangerous for women's political power in future. Um, it is a politics of recognition which is denied to half the population, which has serious consequences for their capacity to be credible leaders subsequently. So the process of determining who comes to the table, and international actors are very important for this, but this can also be done without international actors, and that's what happened in the Philippines, in fact, to extraordinary effect. That process of anointment and appointment, recognition, um, is something that actually is part of the creation of political authority that I think we fail to give enough attention to, at least in the international community. And that's why there's a particular uh, obligation on the international community to recognize women and other socially marginalized groups. This, by the way, is a picture of the Liberian uh, Women's Action for Peace um, welcoming in peacekeepers uh, in, in Liberia. Um, Okay, so what are the consequences of women's non-presence in peace talks? Maybe I should first give you proof that women aren't present in peace talks. Let me just um, show you. Wrong order of slides, very sorry. Um, it is still the case that women are less than 10% of the people at the table. And uh, you could well say that the physical presence of women is not that important. Any woman who actually does get to the peace table on the part of a negotiating party is not gonna be there because she's there for gender equality or social inclusiveness. She's there because she's the hardest line negotiator the party can pick. That is true. But once again, there is an important uh, quality of the visual presentation at the peace talk. A woman at the table, no matter who she is, actually is a, it's a doorway. She's an entry point for women from civil society to come and lobby. This is literally how it works. Women from civil society are able, are more attracted to a peace process if they see somebody they feel they can talk to. And it's not just about having women at the table, it's about having gender experts advising the teams, it's about consultations with civil society, um, and it's about um, women as observers able to communicate back to civil society. So we're interested in women in all of these roles, as well of, as, of course, the ideal of having more female mediators in peace processes. Um, and I will be talking about all those roles and what we've learned from women's engagement. So, um, the, this data is from 2011 and it's not much different now. Uh, women are still less than 10% uh, of negotiators. Um, uh, there are very few witnesses and mediators and signatories. The outstanding exception, I keep mentioning the Philippines and it is an outstanding exception, 50% of the government team was female. The chief presidential advisor uh, was female. Um, the signatory, um, Miriam Colel, Coronel Ferrar, was female. Um, on the MILF side, uh, women were involved as advisors to the negotiators, which was a big leap, actually, from what had been there before. The Philippines is a big exception. Colombia, I mean, right now there's a little bit of unsteadiness around the, um, the agreement, but in Colombia, we've got another really interesting example of women's very substantial involvement at all levels. Um, but as far as the UN goes, in terms of appointing a chief mediator, it's only done so once, a woman chief mediator, which was uh, Mary Robinson's appointment in 2013, which only lasted for eight months when she was the, um, the, uh, the mediator for the, or the um, envoy for the Great Lakes region. Um, okay, so now what is the consequence of, of women's exclusion? Okay. Um, you can look at the text of peace agreements to sort of see what it means that women weren't there. And the most obvious thing is that the immediate impact of the conflict on women is often not reflected in peace agreements. So um, the kind of starkest example of this is the exclusion of sexual violence from ceasefire agreements. Since 2011, more ceasefire agreements have mentioned sexual violence as a prohibited form of fighting, but prior to that, there were only six ceasefire agreements out of 45 conflicts since the end of World War II um, that mentioned sexual violence as a prohibited form of fighting. So think about that. That means that a ceasefire means you can promise to stop the shooting, but you don't have to promise to stop the raping. So you can use sexual violence to, um, to pursue political and military agendas, to terrorize communities, to cause population flight, 
to dominate geographical areas, and you won't be in violation of the ceasefire. So there are plenty of conflicts where that's exactly what's happened. Um, so that's probably the starkest example of the consequence of not consulting women and not involving women um, in the negotiation of an, an element of a peace agreement. So this is a very famous study by two Irish researchers, Catherine Bell and um, uh, Carolina O'Rourke, um, who looked at um, 585 peace accords um, since 1989. And um, that sounds like a lot. There haven't been 585 conflicts, but remember for any peace process, there's many, many, many agreements which are signed and then you move on to the next one. Usually the ceasefire or a confidence building measure is the first one or a humanitarian agreement. Then you move on. You write the power sharing agreement, the justice agreement, the wealth sharing agreement, the constitutional provisions if you're gonna take it that far um, and so on. So they find that um, only 16% of all these agreements mention gender or women. And that mention is a pretty weak standard, frankly. By mention, literally, we're including here uh, things like the agreement between the government of Sudan and Darfur applies to the men and women of Darfur. Okay, that's what I mean by including a mention of women. So that means that's pretty meaningless, actually. Um, what we'd like to see is more substantial textual inclusions, and I'll get onto the details of that. A resolution was passed in the, Secu the Security Council in 2000, Resolution 1325, that recognized women's right to participate in peace processes. So the uh, mentions of gender and women in peace agreements has jumped um, now in, those, in anything signed since 2005 to 27%. So it's progress, but it's slow. Um, Okay, so um, what, what are we looking for when we want to see gender mentions in peace agreements? Um, for sure, a prohibition on sexual violence. I'm, I'm sorry, you can't see it very well here. Oh, you can. Um, on the right-hand column, there's a, a, a list of the number of agreements where you would find, for example, a non-discrimination provision. Um, or workers' rights, or protections on human rights, et cetera. Um, now, particularly fruitful from a gender perspective um, are promises of temporary special measures in um, political representation, which means gender quotas or um, support for women to engage as candidates in post-conflict elections. In countries that have agreed quotas of some kind uh, for women, um, in the early post-conflict elections, we see women's participation leaping at the very least to the level of the quota and often well beyond. In countries that don't have quotas, um, the participation of women, women's success rate as candidates in political competitions has remained stubbornly stuck at the 10% mark. Sometimes a bit under, sometimes a bit over. So countries like Haiti, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and DRC women have really struggled to get above 14% in politics. And in recent elections in all those countries, in 2013, women fell back down to the 10% mark, which is simply tokenistic. It's not enough to have a serious group influence on decision making. Other provisions which are really valuable uh, and very rare. Um, you can see here right at the bottom, um, women in the police, five agreements. Have anything on that? Um, uh, very, very little, there's very little said about security sector reform um, and the uniformed security services from a gender perspective in peace agreements. And yet, in countries where there's more women in the police, um, more than 5%, more than 5, 10%, what you tend to see is something quite extraordinary, a massive leap in the rate of reporting of crimes of sexual violence if people know that they can report that crime to a woman in the police station. And very interestingly, that reporting rate is, it stands for boys and men too. Boys and men will report sexual violence much more readily against themselves, much more readily if they can report to a female police officer. So getting more women into the police is actually one of the most powerful confidence building mechanisms that you could actually invest in in a peace process because it 
uh, changes the character of the police. The same goes for military, of course, um, and that's a huge other area, security sector reform and disarmament. Um, but as a confidence building me measure, it changes the face, literally, of the police and builds confidence that human rights um, will be better respected by the security forces. Um, I'm just trying to see on this list if we've mentioned land and I don't see it. DDR processes are there, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Again, very rare to see mention of women in DDR processes. We find that today in the Mindanao Agreement, in the Nepal Agreement, uh, in places where women have been significantly present in fighting forces. Um, there is encouragement of gender equal provisions for the disarmament and uh, reintegration of, of women and men soldiers. This is really tough to do. Countries have a hard time doing this. Two reasons, um, and this is taking me a little off track. In Nepal, for example, when the, um, the Maoist soldiers were kept in cantonments um, wait, awaiting a peace agreement and awaiting the resolution of the constitutional crisis, the women soldiers just left. They went back to the village because they had to take care of families and old people. They couldn't hang around anymore, which actually put them at a terrible disadvantage when negotiating DDR arrangements. So male soldiers ended up getting a um, employment package that it would include finance, like credit, agricultural credit, possibly access to land or the chance to purchase land. Uh, women were given weaving lessons. That's a, a gender biased uh, investment um, in, in women's needs. Um, gender specific reparations are also needed as well as gender attention to gendered war crimes. That's another important feature that you'd want to see in peace agreements. Um, it's very rare, first of all, that sexual violence is mentioned explicitly as a crime that needs to be addressed by the justice system and for which reparation is necessary. Reparations for sexual violence are still very rare. There are some countries where they are in place, Bosnia, for example, um, and the uh, resolution of the Thomas Lubanga case in, um, I, in, by the ICC for Congo included an obligation to pay reparations, however, no resources to do so. One of the best experiences we've ever seen at the UN in reparations for sexual violence comes from Sierra Leone, where the government's uh, reparations program was run by um, a gongo, a government NGO, and um, there was a great eagerness to provide reparations for sexual violence. Um, and women would come forward um, and uh, as, as a reparation, they were asked what kind of vocational training they wanted and they all said either hairdressing or um, tailoring. And somebody clever um, at the uh, Reparations Institute said, you know, there's a lot of hairdressers and tailors around. That's kind of a saturated market. Why don't you guys take driving lessons? Which was a piece of genius because um, in Sierra Leone, there are now a lot of women drivers and they are highly desired by international organizations and businesses all over the country because women drivers are, uh, well, they don't run after women on the road, they don't get sidetracked and they don't drink that much. And um, you know they've proven to be a highly reliable workforce. So it's a very interesting innovation. And yes, everybody knows they were raped, but Again, get over it. It's an extraordinary example of women claiming, yes, I've suffered a war crime, yes, I have a war wound, and I'm rebuilding my life. Um, but the, these, ex these examples are very, very rare. <clears throat> okay, now, as I mentioned, these, these examples are rare. We have gender-blind peace agreements where the focus is on stopping the fighting, and usually, because the main negotiators in the room are the ones with the greatest power to keep the fight going, the spoilers, in other words, peace agreements really just are about dividing up whatever pie is left in the country between the fighters. So power sharing is about you know, dividing up power in pretty much the portions that they're at at the moment of the peace agreement. Same with well sharing, with, with dividing up natural resource access, mining rights, et cetera. So these are very dysfunctional agreements, and as you probably know, over half of peace agreements fail within five years, and there's a resumption of conflict. Um, peace agreements are dysfunctional. They lack, above all, they lack social buy-in, broad social commitment and buy-in 
especially the peace agreements that are pursued in the traditional way, which is a conversation behind closed doors by the men with guns. Um, and of course, the root causes of conflict are rarely addressed, and the opportunity that I mentioned before for social rebuilding is not seized. Now, there is a now documented payoff to inclusiveness. Recent research shows that inclusive processes last for longer and have better chances of surviving. If you can keep a peace agreement alive for five years, that's a crucial initial hurdle that bodes well for its uh, enduring success. So Desiree Nelson's um, study in 2008, Nelson's study, for uh, 83 agreements found that if there were civil society representatives involved in the negotiation in some way or another, the peace agreement was more likely to survive five years. Um, Laurel Stone in New York um, at Seton Hall conducted a study where she found that um, if women were involved in the peace process in any role, negotiators, observers, mediators, and, and this is the crucial thing, if quotas for women were included in the agreement, um, the chance of a durable peace rose to 78%, which is an extraordinary difference. Now, you know, I find this confusing as uh, a former international policymaker. If we know that there are ways that we can make peace processes last, and remember how expensive and damaging conflict is, why isn't this a number one priority? I don't understand. Would a heart surgeon keep doing things the same way if he had a 50% or she had a 50% fail rate? Of course not. We have a 50% fail rate on peace processes, and yet we still exclude civil society and women. It's baffling. Don Steinberg, uh, formerly the head of USAID, now here in Washington, I think in the World Learning Institute, former ambassador to Angola, um, said that he had no doubt the exclusion of half of the Angolan population um, had a lot to do with the difficulty the Angolan process has had and the many, many relapses into conflict during the 90s. Um, as he said in a very memorable phrase, um, on the subject of sexual violence in particular, and the fact that in Angola, the negotiators not only gave each other amnesty for sexual violence, gave each other amnesty for any crimes against civilians that they had committed in the past, in the, in the, in the course of fighting, they also gave each other amnesty for six months in the future for anything that they might do. Now, that's what he calls memorably, this is men forgiving men for what men have done to women. And that's often what peace processes are about. <clears throat> so if it's so helpful to um, involve women in peace processes, why is it so hard? What are the blocks? Um, well, women don't always or often carry the guns. That's the first thing. They're, they actually cannot threaten to unravel the peace process. So. Um, you know, like many constructive religious communities, they don't threaten destruction. They, they can only bring promises of constructive approaches. Um, so this is a huge obstacle. They, they don't have the essential ticket to the door, which is a gun. Um, another very important problem is that um, where we see uh, women powerfully influencing peace processes, it tends to be in context uh, where the women's movement was already pretty strong and still is in parts of the country. So Colombia now, and I'm so interested in the remarks by the previous speaker actually about community recovery in Colombia and so many of the, the um, I don't know where you are, so many of the speakers uh, in the films were female. Um, but in Colombia, the women's movement has always been very strong. In the Philippines, the women's movement is phenomenally powerful. So in, in places where the women's movement is already strong, um, it can have a strong influence and get a foot in the door. But in many conflicts, that is the opposite of what is the case because the women's movement is devastated, decimated, dispersed, or in the diaspora. And once it's in the diaspora, it is considered illegitimate by local actors, uh, especially if the diaspora comes in talking about women's rights. Then, oh, you're a Western feminist. Your views are not um, uh, relevant to this situation. 
Um, women also need a logistical support, which is and can be expensive, and which is usually not budgeted for in peace, pro in peace processes. Um, in the 2000 Burundi process, which was held in neighboring Arusha, men, the negotiators, flew from um, Bujumbura to Arusha, very short flight, business class. Uh, the seven women on the observer team, representing the 19 parties, had to go overland in a matata, matatu, which is a, um, a van, a bush van, one of them was breastfeeding, had to bring her, ki her baby. Um, Unifem, at the time, paid for the trips, paid for a nanny to come. Um, couldn't afford to pay for the business class, let alone economy flights. Um, and so women are often uh, have uh, domestic burdens that men can shed more easily, but also actually have very serious security problems that a lot of men don't, because women human rights defenders are often at risk, not, be, not just because they're participating in a peace process, but just because they're women and just because they're promoting women's rights. So we've seen in Afghanistan and in Congo, women are attacked and killed just for standing up for women's rights. So they need additional security support. Um, the excuse that's often used about the non-involvement of women is it's going to slow things down. It's going to me mean more consultations, and we've got to get this done in a hurry. It's expensive, and we have to stop the shooting. Yes, that is true. But once you've actually got the ceasefire, it is actually true that if you can slightly take a breath, it's actually valuable to slow down the peace process and enable more consultation with civil society, enable broader social buy-in to frankly weaken the hand of the spoilers. Three or two? OK. Um, Right. So uh, I, I've left to last the best bit, and I don't have time now, uh, some of the uh, powerful examples. So I'm going to actually talk about some of the standout examples of uh, women's engagement. Northern Ireland, um, for the Good Friday Agreement of 1993, women were able, with very little time, to constitute themselves as a political part party, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, and get two seats in the 20-person negotiating table, where they played an extraordinary role, not only advancing gender clauses, but also enabling compromise agreements in the back rooms. Because women aren't there just there to represent women's interests. They are, have an interest in stopping the conflict. In Liberia, they did the same thing. They brought compromise solutions under the radar so that um, the embarrassment of coming to a compromise with your enemy was achieved in private not in public, enabling um, the peace movement to move forward considerably. I've mentioned the Philippines already, so I won't go into that. Um, as observers, uh, women are more easily allowed onto peace processes as observers. It's not a good role. It's only good to improve communication from the table back to civil society, but it doesn't enable women to actually influence the process significantly. The last discussion was about architecture, and one of the most interesting areas of innovation in peace processes is around the architecture and shape of the peace table, and whether or not it's possible to add additional tables. The most striking example of this comes from the, Gu the Guatemala 96 agreement, where there was an assembly of civil society, a parallel table that got to review the negotiations as they went along and feed into the official negotiations. But there's other very interesting examples. In Somalia, because the clan system is so powerful, women established themselves as a sixth clan. And they said, you know, we cross all five clans. We're going to work as a sixth clan and bring reconciliation. In track two, which means off the official table in civil society, that's where, of course, we see quite a lot of innovation. In Uganda and in Mali, women formed peace caravans um, in order to draw attention to um, gendered aspects of the conflict and to women's potential contribution. So what are the keys to effectiveness? What are the lessons that we learn? Actually, the simplest and most important one is that, for heaven's sake, can women get an invitation? Um, and this comes back to the point I made about recognition uh, from the start. Um, mediators, especially international mediators, just don't see women. Literally, they can't see them. Um, they are denied an invitation. And a, there's a very good illustration of this from Mali in April 2012. So this is just weeks after the invasion by jihadists of northern Mali and the rather unfortunately timed coup uh, in southern Mali that replaced the democratically elected government with a military junta. Uh, 
This is, that happened in March, the invasion was early April. Just a few weeks after that, President Compare in neighboring uh, Burkina Faso convened an emergency conflict uh, resolution meeting. Because the Malian government was hardly legitimate, the military junta, there was a huge effort to involve civil society. Very unusual, very unusual circumstances. 80 civil society organizations were invited. I'd like you to guess how many of those organizations were women's organizations. Whoever said zero, whoever said zero. Zero, now this is very funny. Mali has a powerful women's movement, a very important one that had been a big part of the early democratization struggles in the 80s and 90s. Um, and on top of that, it had a well-networked women's uh, peace movement networked with West Africa. Now, this is my last example, so I'm gonna stop on this. I'll just finish telling the story. Now, just about a month before that, UNIFEM had organized, actually UN Women, had organized a network of women West African peace leaders in um, Abuja, and we'd had a big training meeting on mediation and learning how to engage in peace processes and so on. And the women we invited were heads of women's organizations, including three from Mali. So those three in Bamako, the day the conference started in Ouagadougou, walked into our Bamako office with one other woman peace leader and said, why the hell weren't we invited? We're peace leaders. And to her credit, the head of the office uh, um, in, in Bamako dug into her pocket and bought them three flights that day immediately to go to Ouagadougou. They got off the plane at night, it was cold. They went into a hotel, they had no idea where the talks were being held. Overnight, they called all their sisters in West Africa in this peace network and figured out that the third cousin, twice removed of one of the women, um, actually knew President Compare, put in a phone call. They found out where the peace movement, the peace talks were. They showed up the next morning. It was very cold, so they had covered themselves with shawls. The security guards demanded to see their passes, which of course they didn't have. And the women said, we will not lift our shawls and show you our breasts. Um, you know, they used the sort of gender card, the kind of grand dam, and the security guards were like, oh, sorry, ma'am, sorry, mom, and let, let them in. They went straight up to Compare saying, your third cousin twice removed is my friend, whatever the connection was, and he said, okay, fine, you can have five minutes. Um, the five minutes was revolutionary. They were able to bring up the extreme levels of sexual violence by the jihadists in Gao, in Timbuktu, in the north of Mali, and demand women's participation. It shouldn't have to be like this. That was the story of my life. It's the story of Bonnie's life, observing at the, at the UN. It shouldn't have to be like this. Why can't we be invited? How scary are women? I can tell you so many stories like this. So the first lesson is it would be nice to have an invitation and try to work on redesigning the architecture of the table itself so that it is standard practice to have civil society participation. Another lesson is women's uh, intervention works very well when they're walk working across ethnic lines, across religious lines, and there's many examples. All the cases I raised involve national coalitions and, and caucuses of women working across the lines of conflict. It builds their credibility as a third party. Um, international and regional connections um, count. And then um, trying to enable compromise agreements in private, which is something that women's groups have been very good at, as well as agreeing a minimum common standard. So a certain level of technical uh, know-how has been very valuable in these processes. And I will end with a picture of three fantastic peace leaders, uh, Tawakul Karmen uh, from Yemen, Leima Bawi from Liberia, and President Alan Johnson Sirleaf from Liberia. Um, and Lema's quote, when the powerless start to see that they can really make a difference, uh, nothing can quench the fire. Thank you so much. <laughs>